a lot of things. What is likely to be the focus this time, Professor Morandi? As you point out, there, there's a lot going on. Um, I think perhaps for the Iranians, the most important issues are U.S. support for uh, extremists in the region, meaning that the, that the United States is uh, supporting efforts being made by the Saudis, the Israeli regime, as well as the Turkish government to continue supporting Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda affiliates, meaning the Nusra Front, among others. But also, in addition to that, I think the Iranians feel that the United States is uh, moving away, further away from the Joint Comprehensive mm. Plan of Action. The belief in Tehran is that under President Obama, the United States gradually began to violate the agreement increasingly as time went by and Congress as well as the Senate passed laws that were in conflict with the agreement. But after Trump, there has been a, an escalation of sorts. I see. And uh, right now we see that Congress and, and Senate and the U.S. Senate are on the verge of passing new sanctions against Iran. And President Trump uh, has been calling on for, uh, countries not to do trade with Iran, which as the Iranian foreign minister pointed out, is explicitly in uh, it, co it contravenes, it contradicts okay. the, uh, the, 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 con the text of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. All right. Mr. Walsh, I want you to respond to that. Two issues. One is the Iranians' so-called concern of U.S. relations with the regional power in the Middle East, uh, particularly Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and some of the others. The second, of course, is a nuclear issue. Let's begin with the regional powers. Yeah, I actually agree with my colleague that that's the m more central uh, issue right now. There, there, there are the two issues, and they are functioning largely in different categories. Uh, but the real change in U.S. policy, a dramatic change in U.S. policy, has been a real tilt towards Saudi Arabia. And you saw that in President Trump's uh, summit with the Gulf Cooperation States, his backing of the war in Yemen. And then most recently and strangely, his tweets regarding uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, because now there's a fight within the That's right. uh, GCC community between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And he backed, even though the U.S. has a giant base in Qatar, he backed the Saudi uh, view on this. And so there does seem to be a real tilt in U.S. relations. And of course, Saudi Arabia and Iran are in the middle of this very ugly, deep uh, rivalry. So the U.S. sort of taking one side here, I think, has made the region more tense. Right. And then separately, the nuclear issue, you know, I don't think anyone's violated the deal yet, uh, but I do think it's on more uncertain territory as the overall relationship grows more uncertain. But I'm, I think uh, the Iranians see that the Iran nuclear agreement is in their self-interest. They're, they're benefiting from their trade with uh, China and India and Europe, and they're not going to look to tear it up. Uh, and the U.S. We're, we, uh, you know, continues to certify sanctions waivers, so it, it's sort of a bumpy process. But it's continued so far, and I expect it will continue in the future. Very interesting views from both sides. Let's go to Mr. Li here in Beijing. Of course, you are looking from outside toward that direction. Uh, first of all, after the Iraq war, more than 10 years ago, there has been gradual gaining ground of Iran in the region as a result of this very ugly war. So how much will this so-called walk away from the earlier balance set up by the, the Obama administration, now Trump going to have a very different approach, likely to change that picture much? I think, you know, as you said, that after the Iraqi war, and uh, you see that, you know, the American war on terror in the region has dramatically, you know, changed the balance of uh, power in you know the whole Middle East, mm. and Iran rising to be a major regional uh, powers, and uh, during you know the Obama because of his uh, repunishment with Iran because of the nuclear deal, Iran you know the influence uh, get much more, and you know the, the U.S. Uh, President Trump tried to reverse this kind of uh, uh, trend, and uh, you know the uh, Trump to realign 
or strengthening you know, its traditional airlines in the Middle East. Right. And that this is trying to neutralize the you know, expansion and the influence of Iran. But the question is, will it be done? And it will be very, very hard. You can see, you know, I agree with my American friends said, because of the Trump's policies, uh, you know, there'll be more, you know, tensions, there'll be more mm -hmm. unstabilized kind of situation in the Middle East. Right, what about the nuclear deal? Uh, of course, uh, the Iranian foreign minister before going to New York had been accusing of the US side of violating the deal and also urging Trump to come and go align with what has been earlier agreed. But this is a new administration. President Trump did things very differently from his predecessor. So will these kinds of trades of words, accusations, work eventually for the two sides to seek a solution? I think, you know, it will be very, very difficult for the two sides to seek the solutions. And uh, the best that we would hope is that, you know, they are only in a trade of war of words, mm -hmm. no actions. Because, you know, the nuclear deal is uh, so much important, uh, not right. only for the both countries, uh, also for the world. That's right. As you said, it is not a deal just between Iran and the United States, but rather Iran with many of the global powers, including the Europeans. Mr. Walsh, therefore, the U.S., some say, and Europe is in a collision over the issue of the Iran nuclear deal. Remember, the European Union was a big player in reaching this deal. And we don't see these days a beautiful honeymoon days between the United States and its European allies to begin with. So will this uh, further escalate the kinds of differences, divergence between the two sides? This is not just Iran and U.S., but rather much more complicated than this. Yeah. Well, the JCPOA is an international agreement backed by a UN Security Council resolution. Mm. It is not a bilateral agreement between the U.S. and Iran, so you're absolutely right. I think if things, if push came to shove, and I agree with my Chinese colleague, I hope that this just continues uh, in the theater of words and doesn't start to, you know, uh, uh, turn into real actions. For example, I, I hope that neither side is going to file formal complaints about the others at the, uh, at the, uh, Commission at the Agreement Commission. I think that would be a mistake and that could have unintended consequences. But to your point, it's an international agreement. I think the Europeans would back, you know, if the U.S. sort of went in there and tears it up, I think the Europeans are going to stick with the agreement. I will say, though, based on recent conversations, mm. that I expect the British, who you know are having their problems with the EU, may very well uh, follow the U U.S. on this. I see. So I think you're really talking about a fracturing of the European point of view. Let me finally add quickly, Tian, because I thought your question was a good one, that the balance of power did change after the war in Iraq. I think you're absolutely right. It took Iraq off the table and that changed the regional dynamics. Mm -hmm. I think Iran has always been an important player in the region. It's always going to be an important player because of its oil and its size and its differences. But I think there's some talk in the U.S. and elsewhere that overestimates uh, Iran's rise as a this gigantic uh, menace. I think they do have more influence in Iraq today than they did in past years, but th the future of that's unclear. Right. And militarily, they are not the top-ranked country. Okay. The top-ranked countries are Israel, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. So I would say let's keep this in somewhat in perspective. All right, then. Let's also keep it in perspective when it comes to the Iranian nuclear deal. Professor Morandi, we earlier talking about, you know, the very complicated bilateral, multilateral relationship as a result of this deal. But within Iran, there are a lot of things going on as well, because you do see divisions among different factors in Iran. Their attitude still toward this deal is different. And today we heard about the arrest of the brother of the current president, who is believed by many as a reformer kind of person inside your country. And we all know the foreign minister is being labeled as that as well. So the question is, when you have oppositions from outside and not try to follow up with the deal, within your country, is it likely to be more fractions as well? And how complicated will that make things, both inside your country and also regionally? Professor Morandi, it's a long question, but this is an important question. 
Well, I would disagree in the sense that uh, there are no real differences in Iran among mainstream politicians with regards to the JCPOA. Uh, everyone believes that Iran should stick with the agreement. There are those who think that it's a good agreement. There are those who think that it's not a great agreement. But everyone believes that it has been agreed upon and Iran is, will abide by its commitments. The issue with regards to the financial allegations against the brother of the president really have nothing to do with this. So it is not going to be Iran that uh, tears up the agreement. The Iranians will only end the agreement if the United States does so first. If the United States wishes to exit the agreement, then the Iranians will believe that um, then there's no purpose in pursuing it. But I, uh, I Professor think Professor Morandi, uh, may, 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 I just, re, may I just try to confirm with that, you what you just said? Uh, are you suggesting if the U.S. walk away from this deal, which Iran reached with multilateral players, that Iran will also walk away? despite of its deal with other players as well. Is that what you're suggesting? If, if, if the deal, if the U.S. Uh, tears up the agreement, then ultimately what happens is that the end game becomes unclear because after a certain number of years, uh, the situation with the Iranian nuclear program must uh, become like every other country. In other words, uh, all the permanent uh, uh, UN resolutions mm. that have been put on hold, uh, their status will be unclear. So if the agreement, if the United States exits the agreement, then I think that it's quite possible that the Iranians will see that it's useless. But at the moment, I don't think that the United States wishes to do so. Right. The United States is violating the agreement. I disagree with your good guess there. It, the very fact that uh, Trump has tried to prevent Iran's trade from normalizing itself is uh, explicitly in violation of the agreement. Yeah. But I think that what has changed is that the United States is much more isolated today because of, partially because of Trump's policies. Mm. Uh, the Europeans are not happy with what uh, Trump is doing, the Chinese, the Russians, and, and by and large the international community has many trouble problems with the United States. So it is more difficult for Trump to create a coalition against Iran. I agree with, uh, with the issue about Britain, but then again, the current British government is a weak government. The opposition, the Labour Party, That's has right. a very different policy, actually, when it comes to Iran. And the balance of power in the region has changed. I, mm. of course, disagree. Israel is not a powerful country. It's only uh, it's because of U.S. support right. that it's able to maintain the status quo. Okay. The Saudi regime is very weak. We've seen it lose a war in Yemen. So Iran and its allies are much more powerful today than before. Iraq is a friend of Iran. Iraq is becoming much more powerful. Iraq, I Syria is stabilizing. The Saudis have lost the war in Yemen. The Saudis have basically lost its battle with Qatar, which is one of the strangest things that we've been seeing in okay, uh, recent Professor Morandi, years here's one to Wahhabi. Crucial, the, the Saudis can't tolerate the Wahhabi. So Saudi a, Arabia is in a weak position okay, at the moment. All right. There is a crucial question that I really need to ask you about this, which is when it comes to this kind of deal between Iran and the international community, how much can Iran exert pressure on Washington now? and skills and strategies now, so that Washington, even under the Trump administration, would be able to, to a certain extent, still follow up on that deal. Today, Professor Morandi, we have heard the news that uh, a Chinese-American young man, graduate student supposed to be, has been arrested by Iran and put in charge of 10 years in prison. But of course, those are just one of those things that happen. But the thing is, uh, will pressure like this uh, from Iran likely to make Washington think twice about its walking away from the deal? Uh, what kinds of things Iran can still do, Tehran today, to make Washington come back to, to the original deal? Professor Morandi, do you think there's remedy? Well, with regards to the uh, individual who was arrested on espionage, I think that has nothing to do with uh, Iran-U.S. relations uh, in the sense that 
he was not arrested uh, to put pressure on Washington. Uh, every time that someone is arrested in Iran and charged with espionage, the United States will always uh, deny it and say that they're innocent. Mm. Yet, uh, and that the Western media will abide by uh, the policies of the U.S. government. Yet we have many Iranians in the United States who've been arrested over the past couple of decades, as well as Lebanese okay. and others who really so have been in, in prison. I know a couple of them personally, and uh, no one says anything about that. Mm. The problem between Iran and the United States goes back to two issues. One is that the Iranians see, believe that the United States does not want to allow the JCPOA to function as it was supposed to on the day of, of the agreement. I the see. second issue, as I said earlier, is what Iran sees as U.S. continued support for extremism. Wahhabism, which is being exported by Saudi Arabia, has become okay. a global menace. And ever since the fallout between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, we see that the Saudis and the Qataris and others, and even Western countries, are speaking more about what the Saudis have been doing to let's spread go extremism. To so Trump's support for Saudi Arabia is ironic in this regard. Let's go to Mr. Walsh, because, because I Saudis need to have Arabia. a balance of time for among all the guests. Uh, it's not that anyone do not disagree with you, sure. but rather a, a balance of uh, time. Uh, Mr. Walsh, uh, respond to what uh, Professor Morandi just said. Secondly, mm -hmm. what is going to mean for Washington if the Trump administration really walk away from this deal, this nuclear deal between the international community and Iran? Mm -hmm. Will that be another layer of, shall I say, disgrace at least uh, from the outside uh, after the uh, U.S. Uh, apparent withdrawal from the climate agreement? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, let's say several things. One, I, I do have questions about this arrest of this uh, Chinese-American graduate student. It certainly doesn't have the look and feel of an intelligence operation. And I have had friends right. in Evan Prison who have been released and others. And I, I think if anyone's been arre arrested anywhere on uh, the wrong charges, they should be released. But I do have concern there. As for the future of the JCPOA, you know, I think we're more in a, rather than having remedies to the problem, I think for the, the, for the next short term and medium term, we're more in a defensive mode. That is to say, of sort of preserving and holding on to what we have as we get through this stormy period. And so I don't see any remedies. I'm afraid certainly the U.S.-Saudi relationship is not going to uh, you know, suddenly reverts itself in the next uh, six months. Although with, you know, Mr. Trump, all things are possible. That's probably not going to happen. So I think that we'll, we'll see continued tension in the U.S.-Iranian relationship, unfortunately. Okay. And that the goal here will be to sort of just, despite the noise, stick with the agreement. And then if he does, but I, I agree that your final question is what happens if he pulls out. I think it is possible. I don't think it's likely. But I think it's possible, and it may depend on things that happen domestically That's here right. in the U.S., whether he's feeling under siege or not. And I would say the climate thing is big. You're right to put your finger on it. But he could pull out of that without destroying the whole okay. thing. This would be different. Right. I think the Iran agreement would be a different challenge. Okay. Uh, before we go, I need to have Mr. Li also here in Beijing to say a few words. Of course, things are very fluid at this time. It depends on all the domestic politics in the two countries that we talk about and also what's going on there in the region. So, Mr. Li, some final words and thoughts from you as well. I think, you know, because, you know, the nuclear deal at this moment not only serves the interests of the United States, uh, the Iran, and as well as, uh, you know, the international community. Mm. And so I believe that, you know, this is uh, an international and the community and approve the deal. So either sides, or I mean, you know, the US or Iran, if they walk away, but international community would not allow them to do that. 